We are looking forward to a, uh, a very effective meeting here today and uh, through the weekend <coughs> in which uh, I believe you will uh, hear from the most distinguished people uh, in our country about matters of memory, matters of uh, practice, and matters of recovery. Because it is all of those matters that need to be surveyed now at this period uh, in uh, the uh, phase of dealing with the false memory condition. Now the important thing to remember about this uh, meeting is that it is uh, focused on the matter of the false memory syndrome and how it has uh, first emerged in this contemporary era and what aspects uh, of its accompaniments we can understand and appreciate. Now, as I said, we're going to have many people talking about these matters uh, over the weekend, but I wanted to begin by just reminding you um, that um, the uh, phenomenon that we're dealing with is a, a phenomenon that did not begin in the, in the clinical literature or the scientific literature, but began, in fact, in the paperback literature in the early 70s, and has progressed in a way that identifies the nature <coughs> of the clinical problem and of false memory. And uh, I want to just remind you of this because I will uh, be referring to this again. The, essentially, the first time when the problem of uh, repressed memories and multiple personality disorder emerged was in uh, the early 1970s when this book, Sybil, was written to review the experience of Cornelia Wilbur, who had one case in which she said she now saw what was behind the multiple personality disorder. Now, multiple personality disorder was a very great rarity of diagnosis. It was appreciated as an artifact by most people and uh, was diagnosed very seldom. But after Cornelia Wilbur uh, uh, work was published in Sybil and the claim was made that uh, uh, behind false memory, uh, behind uh, multiple personality was this repressed memory, uh, the diagnosis of multiple personality exploded in our, in our nation and many people, and we'll show you the practices in which these people uh, developed the view that they had multiple personality, uh, came forward. Some thousands of people now uh, believe that they have multiple personality disorder to explain the psychiatric symptoms that lead them to therapists. Uh, the problem was this association with a view of the mind that it could uh, uh, have a repressed memory in it spread and by 1979 a new idea emerged, namely that many patients uh, coming for treatment for depression, for anxiety, for bulimia, in fact had been sexually abused and forgot it, the sexual abuse having taken place in a satanic ritual. And uh, the book Michelle Remembers um, brought forth this idea uh, in relationship to a, a case. And from that point on, satanic ritual abuse was believed by many people and has been uh, a part of, of, uh, of practice. Now, if you look at the psych psychiatric literature or the, uh, any of the psychological literature, you will not find any report on uh, satanic ritual abuse that comes before Michelle remembers. This was, this paperback book uh, uh, was the uh, fountain of that, but uh, no evidence for satanic ritual abuse has ever been found in our nation. No uh, bag of bones, no crimson robes, no horn figures, no more evidence has been found for satanic ritual abuse in our nation than was found for the satanic, for the witchcraft uh, claims that persecuted so many people in the 16th and 17th century. But uh, this was also based on the idea that somehow the mind could repress such a vile memory and propose its existence because of patient reports. Finally, the idea of uh, a repressed memory uh, 
uh, led to this paperback book, Communion, in which it is claimed that uh, many patients now remember having been carried by aliens into spacecraft where they were sexually abused, and they now discover that that's the explanation for their depression, their uh, anxieties, and the like. And this also depends upon the concept that the, the mind could hold a memory uh, 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 and repress it, and then bring it forth somehow uh, later in the course of an illness. Now, <clears throat> I believe that everybody must agree that the th thousands of people who believe that they were carried off by aliens harbor a false memory. Now, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> In fact, I say to you, anyone in the audience <coughs> who thinks that there are aliens carrying people out to the asteroid belt will not find anything in this conference that will illuminate uh, their mind if they believe that. <coughs> uh, but, and, and we laugh a bit on that, the, the, the difficulty is individuals who see me put this slide up uh, this way uh, uh, sex abuse, if you combine that which we know exists, and we do know that so childhood sexual abuse exists, along with and beside this absurd idea. Uh, well, I, I accept that that could be an interpretation of what I'm putting up here, but in fact, the reason I, I display this slide is to make the point that the concept of repression uh, carried to the extreme that it has been with the, re the concept of repression of whole weeks of one's life is such a slippery slope that will go from anything that could be real to something that would be absurd. And this is what defines the problem of false memory. The fact that things can be uh, so absurd leads us to think about what might be happening about issues that we know could exist, childhood sex abuse. And uh, <clears throat> that leads me to this uh, slide that is going to be the subject uh, essentially of our conference uh, as we uh, work together. This is a fourfold table uh, that is a standard epidemiological approach to any clinical problem. And it's, it says, uh, look at this issue of abuse, uh, sexual abuse in, 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 uh, in, let us say, in childhood, uh, and recognize that uh, the population will divide uh, themselves, all the people in the world will divide themselves into those who were abused, in this column, yes, and those individuals who were not abused, no. As well, though, we have patients that have memories of abuse, uh, some people have a memory of abuse, and some people do not have a memory of abuse. And the memory uh, arose, intersect with the historical columns to form four different cells of people in the population. Uh, notice how it works. That is, there are people who were abused and remember that they were abused. We're going to call them the uh, group with a hit. There are plenty of patients, fortunately, plenty of people who were not abused and have no memory of it. We're going to call them the unaffected. There are people, we say, who were abused and have forgotten it, have no memory of it. They are in the forgotten uh, group. They have forgotten it for a number of reasons, including uh, the fact that the abuse may have occurred in such early childhood before memories get laid down. And finally, we believe that there are people who are not abused but have a memory of it. We call them the false alarm. For example, the alien abductions are in the false alarm group. Now, it is our point that there are people in every one of these cells. There are, uh, obviously, there are many patients who have been cruelly uh, sexually abused and remember it. There are many people who have not been had that experience, nor have any memory of it. I mentioned the false alarm, and I mentioned the forgotten. In the conference uh, that we're holding this weekend, we will have people talking about uh, the, uh, the, the individuals that constitute each one of these cells. And you will see that we have evidence for people in each one of these cells. However, the problem, the major problem, 
that comes up and what is an aspect of practice is when there are people who have no memory of being abused and then claim to have recovered a memory of abuse. Go up on the memory side from no memory to a yes memory. And I lay this <coughs> fourfold table out for you because it demonstrates an issue of practice, an important issue of practice. When someone goes from no memory to a yes memory, that does not decide for the therapist whether they have ascended the hit column or the false alarm column. Are you with me on that? The change of memory from no to yes does not imply that you have gone from forgotten to hit any more than it implies that you've gone from unaffected to false alarm. It is the responsibility of the, practice, of the practitioner to make an honest and sincere effort to decide which column has been ascended by the patient before he or she says that they have a hit here rather than a false alarm. We will be showing you much evidence about the nature of practices that will allow this distinction to be made. And we will also be showing you uh, examples of practices in which no effort was made to do this uh, decision. And uh, many uh, people with a false alarm have been uh, thought to be a hit. <clears throat> the essence then of this conference is to combine the experience of uh, scientists, practitioners, patients and families to talk together about the experiences we've had in relationship to this false memory phenomenon. And to, at the end of this conference, uh, appreciate how the appropriate practices should be carried out so that people who have victimized children will be identified and those people who have been falsely accused and whose families have been disrupted will uh, be uh, understood and practices of psychiatrists and psychotherapists change. That, after all, is the reason why I'm in the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins is involved in this matter. We are concerned about the practices of psychiatrists. We try to teach appropriate practices and we try to study it. In fact, we make, a po make the point that psychiatry, like all branches of medicine, is a practice rather than a science. And that's why we will be talking about practices here as well as science. Science illuminates practices, but also tradition, the traditional standards of practice, and the tr traditional ways in which a practice is carried out are important, as well as the organized experience of the practitioners. And much of what you will hear today is to demonstrate that if some practices in psychiatry are sustained and become standard, then no family who has a member in psychotherapy is safe from persecution. And that's what we want to stop. And it will be over the study of these with other people and other scientists uh, and other clinicians that will make this point. <clears throat> so with no more further ado, I want to turn the conference over uh, to Dr. David Holmes, who is uh, one of America's most distinguished psychologists who has written classical work on the matter of repression and who will carry uh, uh, the chair in the first conference. Dr. Holmes. It's, uh, it's frequently said that children should be seen and not heard. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know that chairs should neither be seen nor heard. My job is simply to get the speakers out here who you want to hear and then keep us on, uh, on schedule. So uh, with that uh, in mind, I want to begin this morning by introducing the person who is obviously sort of the first lady of memory, uh, Beth Loftus. Beth, where are you?